Hello and welcome to today's episode of Loki TV, where we are joined by Laura Ciciri, the founder of Supply Chain Insights, to discuss how to start a career in supply chain. The topics that we will cover today are what skills are really key to succeed in this field, what are the typical challenges that a supply chain practitioner is dealing with, and finally, what advice can we give to young professionals seeking to excel in this career. Uh, so, as always, uh, Laura, we would like to kick things off with uh, having a brief introduction about our guest. Uh, so, if you can start by telling us a little bit about yourself. My name is Laura Ciciri. I've been an industry analyst in the space for two decades. And an analyst helps companies to understand the questions they should ask. And I don't call myself a consultant because I consider consultants as knowing all the answers. So. I do research and I probe and try to get at truths uh, in the supply chain. I write for LinkedIn and Forbes and write on my blog and share research globally with companies. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Laura, again for joining us. And we're really excited to hear your insights and, and you know, your advice that is so valuable for, for everyone watching. Um, so let's kick up with the first question. And why is really a career in supply chain such an attractive opportunity for people? I think a career in supply chain is exciting because it opens many doors and uh, many fun doors. Uh, I can't imagine having a position where I can't think and I can't interact and I can't learn and I think the supply chain offers all three of those. You need active thinking, it's always evolving, and it gives you a lot of great interaction with a company to really understand how corporations work. Jonas, do you agree with the Yes, with and why I, this I, would, is important? I would maybe further add that the way I see it, I've been teaching for seven years at university, is that there is an incredible imbalance between, I would say, um, what people think they want and what the world actually needs. And so you have some fields where you have, uh, I would say literally armies of incredibly talented people who are all fighting for the same jobs and opportunities. I think the most extreme is probably uh, to be part of a team developing video games where it's very, very frequent that you have like 200 super talented applicants for every single position. And on the other hand of the spectrum, I would say there are jobs that are incredibly useful, and I believe supply chain is part of that, where companies are really struggle, struggling to actually find uh, talent. And when I say that supply chain um, are incredibly useful, um, it's not a metaphor. I mean, as soon as those supply chains start to dysfunction, then people go, go crazy because suddenly there is no more toilet mm -hmm. papers in their, in their supermarket. Suddenly what they completely take for granted in their daily life end up missing. And, uh, and so I see, I would say, um, a certain disconnect. And I believe that uh, where for people who want to do good, uh, who also want a path where there will be plenty of opportunity where um, uh, if they are talented, they have a chance to succeed because they are not naturally fighting with uh, an enormous army of super talented people who are competing for just a few spots. I believe supply chains is a very, very competitive proposition. Mm -hmm. There are tons of things to be done, but, but the, the fact that it's also, I would say, still n not wi as widely as we uh, recognize as, mm -hmm. I would say, other fields uh, makes it, I think, something uh, of key interest for, for young people. So it's uh, quite undervalued in general that yes, people don't I realize believe. how I mean, it's pretty valued, but compared to the overall magnitude of the yeah. changes, it is, yes, very undervalued. Laura, do, do you agree that supply chain is, is not as popular as it should be as people don't really realize how impactful it is? Um, I think it has evolved to be more popular in my career. I think... Uh, there'll be 15% um, shortage of people uh, to basically fill positions in by the end of the next decade. And I think it will become more popular as people better understand it. Uh, one of the issues is supply chains are really very new. Uh, the concept of supply chain first started in 1982 as a way to look at source, make and deliver together. And we're still catching up with that as a discipline. It's not as well established as marketing or finance or you know, managerial accounting. And uh, 
it means different things to different parts of the world and different universities. So I think that we're still in evolution, but I think it's very exciting and, um, you know, it pays well. I think, you know, the challenges are exciting. Um, it gives a lot of opportunity for people to grow. And I think, you know, over the next decade, we will have a more equalizing effect as people mm -hmm. get to understand the greater opportunities in supply chain. So it's definitely a, a growing trend in popularity that we've seen in recent years. Um, and for young professionals who are just fresh out of college, very ambitious individuals who are considering, uh, say, starting a career in this field, uh, Laura, what would be your advice uh, for people watching who, who are thinking about this exact question? So if people are interested in supply chain as a career, uh, my recommendation is that they basically are naturally curious and they and basically you know listen uh, they build great talent to tell stories uh, influence management they've got good math pattern recognition skills but it really takes the combination of those human elements of active listening influence management along with mathematical problem solving skills i think to make someone great uh, and so i would encourage people to get diverse experiences and to always stay naturally curious and ask why mm -hmm. uh, Jonas, would you like to add something to that and actually I, I, I'm very aligned with, uh, with Laura and uh, curiosity is key and I would say more specifically what I uh, what I observed among people who have just started their career is that they don't ne frequently they don't nearly pay enough attention to their surroundings you see they have at, at university they have learned to be curious about specific types of curiosities such as um, mostly of the technical kinds, you know, uh, more mathematical theorems, more programming languages, uh, more theories, more this, more that. Those are just, I would say, they are important, but they are, I would say, in nature, more of the same compared to what they were doing when they were studying. But when they joined their company for their first job or second job, um, they, uh, they don't pay very frequently nearly as much attention to um, what is the company actually doing? What is the purpose? What is the purpose of the supply chain? Why, why are things done the way they are done? Is it, um, um, uh, and, and ask uh, very bluntly all those questions. I mean, not necessarily to challenge the, the, the management, but just to learn more. And, uh, and what I observed is that very frequently, uh, when you, you have, I would say, young engineers or people who have you know, grown out of a master that have gone um, I would say for the first couple of years uh, is that when they apply to LOCAD, probably the sort of problem that I see most frequently is that they haven't really learned anything beside being a cog in the very, very specific narrow position they were in. And that's probably, I would say, so, so my advice would be um, take those opportunity to learn extensively and be curious mm -hmm. way beyond just what it takes to actually do what you've hired to do. Because yes, at the beginning, especially in a large organization, you're just a tiny cog in a very big machine. Uh, but if you want to grow and be very, very useful, you need to know the bigger machines and not just you know, mm -hmm. the few parts which, are, which drives your day-to-day -day interaction within the company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And besides uh, curiosity, if we're first discussing these kind of key qualities, uh, besides curiosity, Laura, are there any other that are key qualities really the key qualities uh, for individuals within supply chain um, that would allow them to excel and if so to what extent are these sort of acquired throughout your career that are, to what extent are these trained or are there some that you are just born with uh, that makes you sort of great for a supply chain i think that influence management and empathy and the ability to listen and learn and to tell stories so you know, I see a lot of wonderful people have great mathematical skills, they've got great intuition, but they can't really convince others on direction and how to make better decisions. And they're not sensitive to the fact that people in corporations have their own motivations, their own personalities, their own drivers, 
and they're not observing and listening to the human nature of the organization. And supply chains are made up of lots of individuals who have their own agendas, their own perspectives of supply chain, and being sensitive and observing and being empathetic. And I find that the best way to drive alignment is through telling stories, through humor, and by aligning to those motivations and managing that personal element of the individual within the supply chain, I think is really key to a person's success. Mm -hmm. So be able to kind of bring people along together. These leadership skills are really sort of very important in, in supply chain to drive your team forward. Well, but it's not just leading a team, it's being a good team member. And so often I find that these really bright mathematical minds don't have the ability to take the math or the output from engines and be able to put it into compelling story to be able to drive action. And I'm not, and usually these people aren't leading the team, they're a member of the team. And so I, they are frustrated because other people can't see what they see. So the ability to package insights in a way that it can be absorbed by an organization through influence management and building relationships and telling stories and laughing and telling humor, it's very important to be able to manage the human elements of the interaction as a team member, not just as a leader. Jonas, what do you what do you think about these skills and what are uh, you looking for in, in yes, candidates? Yes, I think again, <laughs> I hope uh, I will not be exactly like Laura on or every single question, <laughs> but I'm pretty aligned with, but maybe with I would say a European slant. Mm -hmm. uh, my take is that uh, where I see again young people out of university most lacking, um, and I'm, I'm mostly dealing, you know, through through local with people that are I would say more of a technical background, but where they are most lacking is uh, in written skills. And um, and when I say and typically the problem is not I mean as I observed the problem is not really to not be able to tell a story, but literally to be able to tell anything at all in written form in a way that is very concise and to the point, and uh, and it is always I would say uh, a struggle uh, and I'm not I'm I'm not sure why but apparently. Universities manage to produce, you know, people that have five years past, you know, uh, of, of actual university and who can't, I would say, do a one page summary that makes sense of a situation, even a situation that is not necessarily super, super complicated. And um, and I believe that is that is probably one of the biggest weakness of at least uh, the, the the way uh, the current educational system works is that it doesn't really emphasize that. And again, I'm not saying that, you know, about, I, I'm not entirely sure that you can train people to, um, you know, have great empathy, empathy and, you know, um, to, to increase their skill at understanding what other people are saying, et cetera. So I'm not sure that those skills can be trained. I mean, obviously you can mm -hmm. train to understand more something, but can you be trained so that you understand faster? I I'm not absolutely sure. Um, and, and same thing about telling stories. I'm not sure if you can actually tra train people to tell great stories. However, to, um, when it comes to actually training people so that they can actually write uh, a, a memo of one page or three page or five pages and to be entirely to the point follow things like the inverted pyramid style where you, you start with the very, very super important things, the conclusions, and then you gradually grow into the fine print of the discussion. That is very much a skill that can be acquired. And in environments like supply chains that are incredibly complex, where it's very easy to be distracted by, you know, literally thousands of details, uh, I believe that this Capacity to be able to, you know, put things in writing in, in ways that are very straight to grasp and, uh, and that are also making a good use of the time of the upper management. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Because indeed, as Laura was pointing out, you don't start as a manager of a team, you just start as a team member. And your first probably mission is to make sure that you make a good use of the time of your boss and even more of the boss of your boss. And, and being able to have those uh, sort of production uh, in written form that are mm -hmm. making excellent use of the time of your management, mm -hmm. I believe it's, it's one of the key ingredients that can really help to make a difference in whether you, mm -hmm. know, you, uh, you succeed in your first time one or two, exactly, mm -hmm. in, in your first job positions. Fair enough. Um, and we also see this trend that software uh, is now increasingly a larger part of uh, a supply chain practitioner's kind of daily uh, daily task, let's say, at work. Um, so when it comes to Excel, which is very, very popular to, to solve supply chain, chain problems and uh, just generally programming, um, so, uh, Laura, in your opinion, what is more important uh, of a skill to have for supply chain practitioners? Is it Excel skills or is it programming skills? I don't think either is where I would start. I think that it's more important to be able to answer what is the question we're trying to solve and what is the right technique. And, uh, for example, 93% of companies will use Excel, but Excel really can't help us with variability to the degree we need. Excel really can't help us with simulation to test a feasible plan. And so I think we need to first start with what is the right question and what is the right technique? And then how do I know if I have a good decision? So I, I don't think that I would frame the question in the way that you have framed it but I find that so many times people get lost in the solve without really saying what is the right question to ask and what does good look like. I think that's a really interesting take because especially you mentioned we want to find what decisions do we actually have to take and what problems do are we actually solving, which Jonas, I know we've discussed with you a lot that it's people focus too much on a solution without really focusing on why are we solving this problem in the first place. Absolutely. And here, again, um, my take on that would be, you see, when I'm trying to teach anything to uh, a young audience, I've been teaching for a couple of years at university, I'm thinking, uh, what will still be of value 40 years from now? And um, the way I approach computers and also sort of smart automation is that fundamentally it's a way to demultiply human intelligence. You, know, you have your own intelligence, there is what you can do, but with a machine, you can do a lot more. Uh, and when we are talking of supply chains, again, those things are very complex. And, uh, and if you can use machine to demultiply your impact, then you can obviously do a much greater service to the company. And in return, the company will most likely be paying you a lot more. Um, so as far, um, you know, demultiplying your mechanical output, that's what a forklift is for. And I think we are pretty far, pretty far down the path of mechanization. There are tons of warehouses that are uh, extensively automated. So on, on this path, I would say we are, I would say quite far down the path of mechanization. Tons of progress ahead, mm -hmm. but, but I would say we have, we have already done the bulk of the mechanization. If we were to compare, for example, how many people you have in harbors to you know, unload one metric ton of merchandise, we have already pretty much cut down the amount of manpower by something of a factor of 1,000 compared to mm -hmm. what, where it was you know, a century ago. Um, so now fast forward, when it comes to the white collar work, uh, I don't think we are anywhere close in terms of productivity gains. Uh, and so there is like gigantic sources of productivities. And, and I agree with Laura that if you don't know which question you're going to answer, then the technique just lets you go faster, but you can go faster in the wrong direction. And that's, that's a, mm -hmm. that becomes a very, very big mistake because then suddenly you have the tools to you know, do more, but if you do more, but it's actually the wrong sort of, mm, of solution that you're problem. bringing to the mm -hmm. company that you're just going to do damage at scale, while in the past you were kind of doing the, the small thing on a much smaller scale. So mm. I completely agree with the requirement of really identifying, uh, is it a problem worth being solved? But then I have another twist, which is until people have, I would say, 
a, a very high degree of fluency in programming, in, um, in, in I would say, technical analysis, mm -hmm. they tend to, be, to, ha to, to feel completely, I would say, buried under just the mere technicity. And what I've witnessed is that it takes people that have really completely mastered those sort of things so that they can entirely detach themselves from the technicities so that they can actually look at the problem. You see, um, again, that's, that's why I casually observe at LOCAD. I don't, it's not necessarily you know, a fundamental truth or you know, it is more like a, a, an anecdotal observation of mine. But nonetheless, my own recipe is that if, if the people that are supposed to solve those problems have really, I would say, a tremendous command over programming, suddenly they can abstract away the programming so that they can literally have enough mental bandwidth to really struggle uh, with the problem, mm -hmm. not, uh, I would say, while remaining confident in the ability that whatever challenge you know, they face, they will still be able to face it. Because otherwise, you see, the other kind of problem is that if you do not have enough technical skills, or if you don't have enough confidence in your capacity to acquire them, what typically happens is that people are going to jump on the solution that looks easy enough to be tackled. And thus, instead of trying to, to approach the very difficult but key problem of the company, you choose other problems that look sure easier that's... just because it feels like it's the only thing that you can do. And you see, and, and here lies the sort of problems where suddenly, instead of saying, I have a very difficult problem, let's try to do something very approximate to solve it, you devolve into uh, something that is not even the problem that face your company, mm -hmm. but at least you have a solution. And then you end up with the sort of solution looking for a problem type of situation. So speaking of problems, uh, what are the typical problems that a supply chain practitioner is, is kind of dealing with every day for, for people watching who are curious to sort of have an understanding of of what they would have to deal with. So the question of what are the typical day-to-day -day problems that uh, someone that's entering supply chain is encountering really depends upon the role. But it typically is in the interpretation of data to understand what is demand and what is supply and what are the constraints and what is the feasible alternatives and then how do I align resources to basically drive a plan? And that'll look different slightly in logistics than it will in manufacturing, than it will in distribution. But the whole core concepts of what can I understand about demand, demand patterns? How do I drive supply? How do I improve reliability? What's the best output? That kind of thinking is pervasive. Jonas, is that also what, what you see when we work with, uh, with our clients? Is uh, that absolutely, also absolutely. Problems? I mean, uh, companies are, uh, that the, the reason why those supply chain, just as Laura pointed out, mm -hmm. came so late, you know, in the, in our, I would say, in our history, you know, the 90s, mm -hmm. it's not, it's just a few decades ago. It's not like uh, it was something that was invented, you know, in the early 19th century or something. Mm -hmm. It's just that um, it took a certain degree of complexity so that this vision did really crystallize. And when you have very complex companies, uh, suddenly the alignment of, the, of all those forces, you know, demand, supply, etc., becomes very complex and thus mm -hmm. it requires some specific skills. And here, the specific twist that, that I would add, you know, in this sort of undertaking is to think when you want to do this alignment between you know, supply and demand with all the constraints, is that is the company treating you like a co-processor of the system or are you actually um, adding value, accretive value every single day to your company? And you see, there are many companies that will take a planner uh, and say, this is your scope, list of SKUs, and then the people will go routinely through the same SKUs over and over. And when you do that, mm -hmm. fundamentally what you are is a co-processor of the system, you know, a human co-processor mm -hmm. of the system. But if you actually try to find a way where uh, you can every single day make the numerical recipes better and then let the thing operate for you, then suddenly your value becomes very, very accurate. And where I believe it is a question of key relevance for people who are joining the workforce right now, 
is that where I see is that in terms of career, if you can have a way to make your contribution accretive so that every day you work, you make the company better and what you leave behind is essentially a, a productive asset that create value whether you do anything or not. Mm. Obviously, you know, compa just compare that. Imagine you have one person that worked one year and every single day this person has been able to very uh, gradually improve the numerical recipes that will generate you know, 0.01 extra percent of return every single day. But after one year, this all put together, that can be something very significant, that maybe a contribution that will add 0.1% of extra return annualized for the company, capitalized, and that will go on you know, for maybe a couple of years, mm -hmm. versus someone who has been doing kind of the same job but in a very different way, where every single day this person has done the job, but then as, as soon as this person you know, stops doing what he or she is doing, then there is, there is no legacy and there is no productive asset left behind. You see, that's the difference between you are, your work is consumed or your work is invested. And my, my perspective, which is very, very, you know, colored by the software background, my software background, is that if you can make your own contribution accretive, um, you have literally a 10x impact in terms of, um, uh, of um, economics on the company. Okay. Very interesting take there, Jonas. And um, um, in general, so we mentioned this kind of in the beginning of, of our talk that supply chain is so often undervalued that, that most don't really realize how comparatively, it is. Comparatively, I would say. Uh, comparatively, so comparatively again, to, to Laura, other fields. I, I say, you know, it's, for me, it's just a matter of whether when we compare to, let's say, video games or maybe finance other or industries, blockchains, yeah. you know, whatever is having, you know, the, the buzz. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that comparatively, it has much less uh, attraction compared mm -hmm. to other niche domains. So uh, then again, how important is supply chain's performance for a business? Um, Alora, in, in your opinion, how involved should the CEO of a company or the founder of a company be with how their, their supply chain is, is run? The concept of supply chain as a complex nonlinear system is pervasive through the organization and not well understood because a trade-off in a function you know, affects the entire system and most people can't look at supply chain holistically. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that you've got to be doing supply chain activities or being in a supply chain function, but the concept of supply chain as a fabric in the nonlinear complex system when companies understand that, they're able to basically greatly improve performance. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when it comes to young people who are looking to start their careers, or maybe people who are already in building their career in supply chain, maybe looking for to change their their job within this field, how do uh, one choose a, choose the right company for them to to work in supply chain? I think. This, quite an interesting question and probably a difficult one to answer as well, but probably a, a very important one for anyone who, who wants to essentially find the right company. I don't, I don't think it's a difficult question. I encourage people to go to a coffee shop and have a quiet moment and write down what's important to them and to think about what are the characteristics of a job that makes something really wonderful for them. So for example, I need to be thinking and learning. So that would go at the top of my sheet. I need to interact with people that are, you know, questioning and, you know, driving forward. I hate the mundane. I, you know, so that's about Laura, but different people have different characteristics in their jobs that they would like. And so I encourage people to go to a quiet space, coffee shop, start with a blank sheet of paper and on one side put everything about a job that is needed for them could be work-life balance could be location and then everything that would make the job not okay for them and then start there and then when they go through the interview process make it two-way and stay centered on the things that are important to you and red flag the things that are not going to make the job success and be true to your heart. Uh, life's a long time and when you're working in a job that you don't like or a career that you don't like 
or a company that you don't like, it's not fun. And we need to try to make it fun and create that right win-win work-life balance. Absolutely. Jans, do you have anything to add to that? I think we can say we, we agree. Very uh, much on... I mean, my, my take is a bit different, but again, my background, which is highly technical, might you know, color my, <laughs> my own opinions. Um, I have found among my students who are typically you know, of a very technical background that it, as far introspection skills goes, it's fairly poor. Um, and so if, if they try to figure out themselves, you know, what they really like in life, they have no clue or they come up with fantasies that are completely disconnected with, uh, with reality. And so my, my suggestion is, was usually to the student is that um, try to identify, you know, a company that where what they are trying to achieve really makes sense and uh, where you can see you know, yourself through potentially decades. You know? Is it mm -hmm. something where you can see yourself on a journey uh, of doing something that actually makes sense? Because there, again, there are many people, you see the sort of problem that I see are people who have fantasies about what would be good or bad for them. They just don't know because again, they have very little experience. They, they have been very protected until they were you know, something like 23 years old um, again, this is Europe, so people are doing very, very little internships and jobs, you know, before they are like 23. So when they come to the job market, they are incredibly, incredibly ignorant. I, I think that's a, a weakness that is, I would say, much more pronounced in Europe than it is in the US. But, but in Europe, uh, it is very frequently surprising to the point that people can reach, you know, the age of 23 and remain almost entirely ignorant of what it is to be part of you know, the economic workforce as opposed to be just a student. Um, so so my, my suggestion is really seek contact see, and, uh, and, uh, and seek something that is going to be very difficult. You see, don't go for the easy path. Go for the thing that is, I would say, at your limit of capabilities. And, uh, um, and, and I say that because most of the time I see people who are um, you know, they are tackling problems that are probably not worth, you know, uh, not worth chasing. Companies, especially large companies, have uh, literally thousands of, I would say, pet projects that are just, you know, stuff that are of limited importance. And, yeah? So is that sort of the red flags to watch out or is there any other particular red flags for people see, trying to navigate all just to give you an, an example so that you, I, I can you know illustrate my thought if for example there is an internship with a topic that has been floating around for two years you know, that is being offered most likely it is at, it is something that is absolutely secondary why because if the problem uh, proposed you know to be addressed through this internship had uh, had any importance it would have been you know tackled two right years then, ago yeah. so if it's floating in the air it is most likely being completely you know unimportant and uh, so, so and, and people would be surprised you know very frequently i see that there are plenty of of i would say made up problems and usually people that are entering the workforce they are just you know uh, people are just spoon feeding them, you know, the, the problems of completely secondary importance, while they should, on the contrary, try to tackle the problems that are very frequently so difficult that nobody in the company even dare to tackle them. Just avoid them, kind of. Yes, I mean, again, I, I mean, I'm not going to tell my own life story here, but you see, my first worst experience was literally uh, to go to. Um, a CEO that was part of the top 40 largest CEO in France, essentially. And I, although I was like a 20 years old student, I just asked this person, uh, what was you know, the biggest problem that their uh, business was facing and how can I help? And uh, uh, so, so you see, is tackle the problem that are, that are very, very challenging. Don't, don't, I mean, and if you're not, I would say, afraid, I would say, of, of failing, that you, you're not trying something hard enough. I mean, usually things should look the way, the, the way it should look to you when you enter the workforce is that those problems should look almost near impossible, it should be like brutally challenging. And again, I'm telling that to people that are young, healthy, 
mostly financially independent. You know, I, I, again, I'm, I'm making a situation where people have the luxury of talking this option. I'm not talking of somebody who is 20 years old and who, by unfortunate fluke of life, has already three children. You know, I'm talking of the, the typical, you know, Western situation where you're 20 plus, your parents are basically independent from you. You can, as long as you are, um, you're willing to, to live poor, you can live poor. You know, you're, you're no, in the no urgent pressure to actually uh, earn any specific amount of money. And if you fail, it is not the end of, you know, the world for you. That, that would be the sort of you know, mm. typical situation that I'm describing. And to sort of wrap it up here a little bit, I want to ask you the last question, um, which is really what advice would you give to young professionals watching now? And if there was ever anything you would have done differently, uh, sort of looking back in your career, and surely, Jonas, you have some examples too, what would you have dif done differently that you can maybe advise people watching now or, or just in general? So my advice would be to try to develop mentors, look for people that you admire and ask yourself why you admire them and try to understand the choices that they made and the mistakes that they made. Then I think what you need to do is to really go on a path of managing self. It's hard to manage self uh, against what your true north is. And um, I think that, you know, you really do need to go with your heart. I, I disagree a little bit with the point that, you know, technical people don't have, you know, the ability to build interpersonal skills and have heart and to uh, be true to themselves. I think that sometimes people's strengths are also their weaknesses, but if they learn to manage themselves, then they're in a much better place. And I think that at the end of the day, we all need to feel like we contribute, that we're learning, and that it's a good place for us to be. And that requires us to manage self. All right, thank you so much, Laura, for sharing this valuable advice uh, to everyone watching. And thank you so much for your time uh, to join us here today. Um, thank you for watching and see you next week.